I'm able to welcome you all to this evening's event and to introduce tonight's uh, speaker. Uh, the event will be chaired by my colleague, Professor uh, Chandra Lekha Sriram, uh, Professor of Law in the School of Law here. Now, um, the topic of tonight's lecture, as you already know, is uh, an ending impunity, the struggle for gl global justice, uh, which I believe you will agree with me is a very important topic in transitional justice, especially in current times. Uh, this evening, we are very lucky to have one of the most competent experts on the topic as our speaker tonight in person of Mr. Jeffrey Robertson, QC. I will say a few words of introduction of Jeffrey, and uh, then uh, Chandra will say a few words before we start the lecture. Uh, Jeffrey is founder and head of uh, Dirty Street Chambers, uh, the UK's largest human rights practice. He has appeared in the courts of many countries as counsel in leading cases in constitutional, criminal, and international law. And he is a distinguished jurist under the UN's Justice Council. He served as the first president of the UN War Crimes Court in Sierra Leone, where he authored landmark decisions on the illegality of recruiting child soldiers the legal limits of amnesties, and the right of journalists to protect their sources. He was active in the prosecution of General Pinochet, the former Chilean president, and Hastings Banda, the former president of Malawi, and also in the defense of Salman Rushdie and Julian Assange. Jeffrey sits as a recorder and is master of the Middle Temple and a visiting professor of human rights at Queen Mary. He has also published widely in this subject area. Some of his publications include Crimes Against Humanity, The Struggle for Global Justice, published first by Penguin in 1998. It is in the third edition, now published in 2006. Uh, also, The Justice Game and The Case of the Pope, Vatican Accountability for Human Rights Abuses, published in 2010. I believe you agree with me that you have a competent hand today to give this talk on ending impunity, the struggle for global justice. I urge you to please help me in welcoming Jeffrey Robertson QC with a round of applause. <laughs> I will now hand over to uh, Chandra to say a few words. Uh, after which, Jeffrey will give his talk, and there will be opportunity for questions and answers after the lecture. Chandra. Will be just a very few words, since Mashoud has already welcomed you all on behalf of the School of Law. I want to welcome you also on behalf of the other co-sponsors of this event, the London Transitional Justice Network, um, which is an inter-university, interdisciplinary network that works on questions of transitional justice, chaired by a number of us here at SOAS, by colleagues in the LSE, and colleagues at the School of Advanced Studies. Um, and I would like to note in particular that we've also had the generous support of the Human Rights Consortium of the School of Advanced Studies for this event. So again, thank you very much, Mr. Robertson, for joining us. Thank you both for that overkind introduction, uh, kinder than I got last week in Glasgow, where the uh, chairman with a very Glaswegian accent welcomed me as a distinguished liar. <laughs> uh, talking tonight about ending impunity happens to be very topical tonight. This morning on the streets of Damascus, the protesters carried banners, Assad to the Hague, or the Hague, or Den Haag, as they say in Den Haag. There was, in Cambodia, the indictment and the opening of the trial of Pol Pot's three most senior lieutenants, put on trial at long last for genocide, 30-odd years after uh, it laid waste to the killing fields of Cambodia. In Bangladesh, we started this week uh, the trial of a man charged with genocide from 1971, that almost forgotten, appalling uh, attack by the Pakistani armed forces which resulted in the rape of 300,000 women uh, and the killing of many uh, Bangladeshis. Then, of course, we have Saif uh, Gaddafi, Saif is, <laughs> will be safe uh, only in The Hague, uh, 
Uh, he won't be safe, I suspect, in Tripoli. But the questions being asked today uh, in a number of newspapers around the world is where should he be tried? At the International Criminal Court uh, in The Hague or in Tripoli? And that's an issue that is uh, burning at the moment. We have Charles Taylor about to hear the judgment uh, of the court in Sierra Leone, which uh, I presided uh, and indeed indicted him, and that is coming out any moment soon. Uh, we have Mr. Bashir, whose movements uh, depend upon the states that are prepared to ignore the ICC indictment. So it's a very tropical subject. And how quickly has it come upon the agenda? No one in the 90s would believe that within the space of 15 years from the, the mid-90s, uh, this subject would be so important, so newsworthy, and so controversial. The idea of the critics, of, uh, uh, including Dr. Kissinger, who said, this will never work. This idea of international justice will take power away from diplomats. We won't be able to arrange situations where dictators leave the bloody stage with their amnesty in their back pocket and their Swiss bank account intact. Well, uh, a lot of people think that's a rather better situation, that they should leave the bloody stage without that ability, but instead uh, facing 20, 30, 40 years in prison. And uh, as I tried to point out this morning uh, in the Times, it really, uh, the fate of Saif Gaddafi, whether he goes to The Hague or whether he is tried in Libya, is really a question of where, uh, of whether he will survive, because international law allows no death penalty. Libyan law invites it as uh, of course, do the people of Libya. So that is uh, another aspect of the debate over international justice. I was one of those uh, who trained the judges for the trial of Saddam Hussein. And we had a terrible battle uh, on the, the, the British side, as it were, with the Americans. Because once they'd captured Saddam, they wanted him killed. And the only way they could achieve his execution was a trial in Iraq in front with, with, with uh, judges who were not independent of the new Iraqi parliament. Well, we argued that Saddam should go to trial in The Hague, where, of course, he could not face the death penalty. Ah, oh, this was intolerable to the Americans. Uh, they said to us, and with good reason, you can't, you can't keep him alive in Iraq. No, we said, he'll probably go to Finland for the rest of his life if he's convicted. Finland! Well, he'll get 140 television channels, most of them showing pornography. We can't, can't have him in Finland. So th this debate was raging, and I suggested to uh, the British uh, Foreign Office that, in fact, uh, we offer to put him where we put Napoleon all those years ago, in St. Helena. Uh, an idea which they took seriously enough to contact uh, the St. Helena authorities, <laughs> who, who replied, well, we're trying to develop a tourist industry <laughs> down here. And we don't think that Saddam's presence would add to it. So we, we did suggest <laughs> the Falkland Islands as a kind of last resort where Saddam and Milosevic uh, could uh, commune with penguins and never be heard of again. But uh, that's some of the dilemmas that we are facing with an international court system, which is very new, which is affecting all sorts of uh, international relations, as the cry for justice on the streets, al assad to The Hague, uh, becomes very, it almost creates an expectation among people on the streets that uh, we will live up to that cry and, and how to live up to it is problematic. Well, how have we come to this stage? I think I can best explain it by going back a little in history and showing you uh, 
the historical development, uh, and I'll do so briefly. But it is interesting that as lawyers, international law began with the Treaty of Westphalia back in 1648, when the countries of, who'd fought the Thirty Years' War got together and made a treaty. And it was a treaty based on Machiavelli's ideas of the prince, namely that the prince was sovereign, all-powerful, one prince couldn't try another prince, the prince could do what he liked with his own people, and no one could intervene. It was the sovereignty principle, and it's found now in Article 2.7 of the UN Charter, the article that says one state must not interfere with the domestic politics of another state. This Article 2.7, which is beloved, so beloved of China and Chinese diplomats. But it's trumped, is Article 2.7, by Chapter 7 of the Charter, which allows the security to intervene if it's essential for the peace of the world, to stop breaches of peace. And it's upon the Chapter 7 power that uh, a lot of international justice uh, has developed. But back in 1648, there was one good thing about the Treaty of Westphalia, uh, and that is that Britain was not part of it. Britain was, in fact, in the process led by Cromwell the British Parliament was in the process of uh, ending the absolute power of the Stuart Kings <coughs> and beginning or putting, uh, or starting the first modern trial of a head of state. Charles I put on trial. Now, it was a very difficult situation for the lawyers who, who had to indict him because, of course, it was treason. Most people believed he was anointed by God. And uh, indeed, the most senior lawyer, who was the king's advisor, told the king, they can never put you on trial. It'll be contrary to Magna Carta. Magna Carta says you be guarantees trial by your peers. And the king has no peers. So that was the argument that uh, he put up. But the way around it was to try him for what was called the crime of tyranny, the crime of um, supervising the torture of prisoners of war during the Civil War, the crime of pillage, of, of uh, burning down and killing innocent civilians, what would today be called a crime against humanity. So he was put on trial, and uh, it were those proceedings shocked uh, the crowned heads of Europe. Cromwell later, I think, made the mistake because his... Uh, conviction was not a foregone conclusion, but they made the mistake of executing him, making him a martyr. And 11 years later, his judges, all those who had signed the death warrant and were still alive, were tried themselves for treason and were taken to Charing Cross and hung, drawn, and quartered. Uh, they were cut down before they were died. Their bowels were cut out and burnt in front of their goggling eyes. So that is, uh, that uh, was not a good start, let us say, for uh, <laughs> putting heads of state on trial. One interesting factor, and it's very interesting that the king uh, said, by what power do you try me to his court? And that's, of course, what Milosevic said, and that's what Saddam said, that's what they all say, by what power do you try me? The answer, of course, is the, the power that has superseded you and your power, but the question of whether it's a legal power uh, is one that we've had to work out. But, uh, of course, there were a number of parallels. These problems of putting heads of state on trial uh, are not new. In, 19, in 1660, when, of course, uh, Charles II came back, um, and the regicides, as they were called, as the judges were called, uh, were disemboweled. The first uh, ten of them went to their disemboweling quite courageously, and uh, there were lots more dangerous Republicans still in prison. And the king was told by his attorney general that he, he couldn't dare try them because the people were turning in their favor against the king. What are we to do with them? We can't... Uh, 
said the king, they'll get out on habeas corpus. We can't keep them in prison forever. I know, said the Lord Chancellor, we'll put them on offshore islands where habeas corpus doesn't run. And they did, and it was regarded as, as disgraceful even in those days, because Parliament, when it got itself together in 1679, passed the Habeas Corpus Act, which applied to offshore islands. And it is that act that was relied upon by the Supreme Court uh, in the great cases in America, which declared that habeas corpus did run to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, so there are lots of, of parallels and interesting historical developments. But to pass over them, there was the trial of Louis the Sixteenth. There was then, of course, Napoleon, who we, we sent to uh, St. Helena. The great human rights conventions of France and of the French Revolution and the American Revolution seem to set out principles that could be enforced. Rights of man, the right not to be tortured, the right not to be killed uh, arbitrarily, the rights, right of habeas corpus, your right against the executive. But of course, they were heavily criticized, as you know from your politics courses, first by Jeremy Bentham, who didn't think much of human rights. Uh, they weren't called human rights, of course. In those days, they were called natural rights, rights that came from nature, or came from God. Well, to Jeremy Bentham uh, and the great English liberals, they were nonsense, nonsense on stilts, because that's not how our rights work. There was no natural right. For Karl Marx, writing on the Jewish question in 1848, these were bourgeois rights. Uh, these, these natural rights were the rights of the wealthy to override the poor. So from left and from right, as it were, there was no support for natural rights as a philosophical basis for erecting any international structure. There was very little done in the 19th century. There was, I think, uh, the first humanitarian intervention which was, of course, the uh, anti-slavery movement, which uh, uh, took the uh, British Navy, went down the coast of Africa, uh, liberating slaves, the Seychelles. The Seychelles were today a descendants of slaves liberated by the British Navy. And I do see that as an early uh, demand for, uh, early example of humanitarian intervention. There were the, the Hellenic movement, Byron and Shelley, uh, fought with Castle Ray, the Foreign Secretary, over whether Britain should intervene to protect Greek, the Greeks uh, from the Ottoman Empire. I met murder on the way. He had a mask like Castle Ray, said Shelley in one of his poems. Uh, what was the Byron poem? Um, something about uh, posterity can never show. Uh, it was written over Castle Ray's grave. Posterity never show a greater grave than this, uh, then stop traveller and kiss. He really, they really loathed Castlereagh, who stopped uh, intervention in, in the, um, to protect the Greeks. But it was eventually taken, and we did intervene. Gladstone, uh, of course, later in the century did intervene. So there are the, but these interventions were not just humanitarian. Uh, there was always something in it for Britain. There was always some possibility of colonialism. But by the end of the 19th century, indeed by the beginning of the First World War, there was no international law remained entirely a matter of relations between states. There was no... Uh, international crimes didn't exist. The argument over the Kaiser, for example, putting the Kaiser on trial was a debate between Britain and America. Britain came to Versailles with F.E. Smith, the Attorney General, demanding that they should put the Kaiser on an international court trial because uh, of uh, unrestricted submarine warfare and the aggression, the invasion of Belgium. The Americans refused, objected, on the basis that the Kaiser was head of state. He had diplomatic immunity. You could not put on trial a political or military leader. 
So the <laughs> Lloyd George's demand to hang the Kaiser uh, went for nothing. The Kaiser remained unhung and lived happily ever after. Uh, there was, during the First World War, the massacre of the Armenians. That, uh, indeed, in 1915, uh, saw about 1.5 million Armenians march to their death, massive death march into the desert of Syria. <coughs> that uh, caused the, uh, uh, an, uh, an international conference to condemn Turkey initially for crimes against Christianity, but the Russians pointed out that not everyone was Christian, so they scratched out Christianity and put in humanity. The crime against humanity began by declaring uh, that the authors of the Armenian genocide, it wasn't called genocide then, that came later, of the Armenian <coughs> massacres would be brought to justice. Well, the British tried. In Malta in 1918, they rounded up the young Turks who'd uh, done this, and they couldn't find a basis for trying them. It was very, it, the, the right of individual rulers to kill their own people uh, was uh, asserted, and there was nothing in international law that could be done about it. We remember Hitler when he was urging his generals to show no mercy uh, before the invasion of Poland, infamously said, who now remembers the Armenians? And if it weren't for a very curious old professor who coined the name genocide and prevailed on, eventually, on the United Nations to pass the Genocide Convention in 1946, perhaps no one would. But what is interesting about this period is that Bentham and Marx had really killed the idea of enforceable human rights because they were, had derided the idea of natural rights. In uh, between, in the 19th century, right until 1938, 1938-39, there was no talk of human rights. In, by academics, by uh, the Court of Justice, the Permanent Court of Justice, the, at the League of Nations, or by any European states people. It was not till a very curious little group of middle-class English socialists, lawyers and writers, got together under the chairmanship of H.G. Wells and Viscount Sankey, who'd been the first Labour Lord Chancellor. And as the world was sliding to war, they devised a bill of, an enforceable Bill of Rights. The idea came to them that there should be uh, a universal treaty for the rights of man, which would be enforceable against nations that uh, killed their own people. It was a remarkable document, H.G. Wells, J.B. Priestley, Baroness Wooden, A.A. Milne would motor up from Pooh Corner to add his uh, bit to the draft. And uh, it was published as a Penguin Special in 1939, and it sold massively, hundreds of thousands of copies translated into 30 languages around the world. The British Foreign Office was so excited by this idea, they translated it into German, and they dropped it on the Nazi tanks as they were going across France. <laughs> they didn't stop to read it, of course, but uh, it went, H.G. Wells had a friend in President Roosevelt, and he read it, and it became the, uh, it, it provided one of the inspirations for his Four Freedoms speech after Pearl Harbor. We are fighting for four freedoms. Freedom of speech and religion, freedom from want and fear. And then, of course, the Atlantic Charter, which elevated the battle fight <coughs> for human rights. Uh, Dan Plesch has done a wonderful book recently uh, from SOAS, I guess, on the, uh, how the United Nations really emerged in, in rhetoric and it then in reality during the war uh, as by way of agreement between Churchill and uh, Roosevelt. But of course, it was 
at Nuremberg. It was the Nuremberg Charter that first put up the idea of ending the impunity of political and military leaders, and we had the trial at Nuremberg. And much of uh, the current development of international criminal justice is really delivering on the Nuremberg legacy. We were very lucky to have got Nuremberg, because Churchill, remembering what had happened, <coughs> when they executed Charles I and how he'd become a martyr, was frightened that Hitler, if put on trial, would use the dock as a soapbox and would uh, develop Nazi philosophy through it. So he was totally opposed to any form of justice on the Nazi leaders. He drew up a list of the top 75 Nazi leaders who were to immediately they'd be arrested, they'd be given six hours to say their prayers, and then they'd be shot. That was the British position. Uh, for Truman, Roosevelt had just died, Truman and uh, Jackson, the Supreme Court judge who was advisor, this would not, they said, sit easily on the American conscience or be remembered by our grandchildren with pride. We've got to give them as fair a trial as, as the circumstances will allow. So it was a complete deadlock between the two allies, Britain and America, and the casting vote went, of course, to the third ally, Joe Stalin, who loved show trials as long as everyone got shot <laughs> in the end. And it was his vote that, in effect, brought us uh, the Nuremberg trials. Now, Nuremberg has been said to be victor's justice. It could otherwise be said that victory gave the power <coughs> to do justice to those who had... Uh, so uh, appallingly brought about the Holocaust. It was a trial which lacked certain elements, as we see, of fairness, uh, but the defendants were defended. The, um, there was no appeal. There was the death sentence. But the judgment at Nuremberg served to confound Holocaust deniers down the century ever after in setting out the facts. It was an extraordinary trial. 23 Nazi leaders were tried, three of them acquitted, in a period of 12 months. That's uh, a record that I keep urging international courts to uh, try to emulate. <laughs> they never do. Uh, it was, if you look at the old newsreels, it's, it's, <laughs> I was a judge uh, in Sierra Leone and uh, uh, know how what, with what uh, contempt some of the defendants uh, treat the court. But it was amazing to see Goebbels, who was then the head of the, uh, the defendants, coming up to, with a great sheaf of notes to be asked to plead guilty or not guilty. And uh, there was a very English High Court judge who was uh, in charge. And uh, he said, Mr. Goebbels, you must plead either guilty or not guilty. And he pleaded not guilty. It was a collapse, literally, of stout party. He dropped his notes and went sheepishly back to the dock. So um, it was, and, and the Nazi leaders extraordinarily decided to play the justice game. I mean, when they were first arrested, Goebbels summoned them all and said, look, we're going to say three words to this court. Catch cry of one of Goethe's warrior heroes, uh, literally translated, kiss my ass. That was what they were going to say to the judges. But as time went on, they got sucked in for the fairness of the proceedings, and uh, it was something that uh, was novel to uh, the Nazis. And uh, <coughs> so they, uh, they, they cooperated, and uh, as I say, some of them were acquitted. But uh, the Jackson, who was the prosecutor, was quite frank about it at the end. He said Nuremberg succeeded because of the Teutonic habit of writing everything down. They had Goebbels' signature on the Night and Fog Decree. That's easy. I mean, in Sierra Leone and other places, we have to draw inferences from unmarked mass graves. There's a mass of forensic archaeology that goes on. You've got to get informers where you don't have, uh, in a lot of uh, massacres, uh, you don't have. Rwanda particularly, um, which is being tried tried at Arusha, you don't have 
documents. They didn't write down who they were going to kill. Uh, you need informers, you need to give witnesses special protection, which generally means flying them to Europe. Uh, it's not easy, and it's a great mistake to think that, uh, as may some people did, that, oh, Nuremberg is this wonderful principle, we can uh, simply emulate it. Uh, you can't. It's a lot more, it turned out to be a lot more difficult than that. But after Nuremberg, of course, uh, there came in 1948-49, based on uh, Nuremberg transcripts and the judgment, the great post-war human rights triptych. You had the, human, uh, the dec Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you had the Genocide Convention, terribly important because it, it <coughs> requires states to take action where genocide is committed, and a few months later, the Geneva Convention. These, this is the great human rights triptych. And uh, there was hope that these conventions, particularly the Genocide Convention, would be enforced and that we would. It, it uh, did away with immunities of heads of state and that people at last, the Westphalian principle, although there in 2-7 in the Charter, would be trumped by uh, the Security Council, or by uh, the genocide uh, entering as a crime in international law. But of course, this all went into cold storage. We had 50 years of the Cold War. We had lots of wonderful conventions in this period. We had the Convention Against Torture, the Convention Against Apartheid, conventions for children, for women, conventions against racism, uh, we had all the good conventions. And as someone said, looking at the killing fields in Rwanda, the road to hell is paved with good conventions. Uh, we had no, you know, in Rwanda, how many people died? 800,000, 900,000 over three months. The United Nations Security Council did nothing. And as Romeo Dallaire says, uh, a few detachments of troops would have been enough to stop the massacre of uh, Tutsis by Hutus largely, but uh, including of many of the Hutu community. Uh, it was appalling at the Security Council to see Britain and America, the Clinton administration and John Major's administration, pretending that it wasn't genocide. You get the transcripts of the Security Council you see these diplomats saying, oh, it's the breakdown of a, pe of a peace accord. It's black on black violence. <coughs> Whereas anyone uh, who saw the handheld camera <coughs> pictures of the hacking to death knew exactly what it was. Uh, it was genocide, but they dared not use the G word until, um, because uh, that would involve a duty under the Genocide Convention to intervene. It was something of a miracle that America actually ratified the Genocide Convention. Uh, it ratified it, Ronald Reagan ratified it in 1986. Very unusual for America to ratify uh, a human rights convention requiring action. But in that case, it was uh, a a, a, a young, obese, protest, bearded protester in uh, Flint, Michigan, read that Ronald Reagan was visiting Bitburg Cemetery during a trip to Germany, and that there were SS graves in Bitburg Cemetery. So he and a friend jumped on a plane with their banners, rushed over, and when Reagan entered the cemetery, they unfurled their banners about uh, America pays homage to the SS. And this went viral, in, uh, not that there was internet in those days, but uh, it was, caused enormous fury among the Jewish, powerful Jewish community in America. And to pacify them, three weeks later, Ronald Reagan ratified the Genocide Convention. And that was the most effective protest uh, that Michael Moore has ever made. <laughs> but uh, it was he behind the banner. And uh, so the Genocide Convention, very important. America ratified it. Uh, 
and uh, it was under the Genocide Convention that Colin Powell uh, finally came into the Security Council and asked them to do something about genocide in Darfur. So there were uh, straws in the wind, but nothing basically happened by way of international conventions, I mean uh, uh, international trials. Pinochet got away with torture. Not torture that was, as in most countries, and 80 countries in the, in the uh, 70s and 80s were using torture. Only one of them was happy to admit it. Pinochet actually was, was made no bones about the torture uh, because it would terrify uh, and destroy the uh, leftist opposition. But uh, so, so nothing really happened to deliver on the Nuremberg legacy, despite the crimes, the crimes against humanity committed uh, in this period. I mentioned the Bangladesh uh, case, but there were many more. Until 1994, and that was really when the Balkans had gone. There was a. I remember hearing the black joke in Sarajevo in 1992. What do you do with a man who commits murder? Oh, you send him to jail for life. What do you do with a man who kills 20 people? Oh, you put him in a mental hospital until he's cured. What do you do with a man who kills 200,000 people? Oh, you send him to a luxury hotel in Geneva for peace negotiations. <laughs> and he was told in Milosevic, and he'd got blacker and blacker. And to, as a fig leaf, really, I think, the UN to, um, as it did, to pretend it was doing something. They set up the ICTY, the um, Tribunal to Deal with Ex-Yugoslavia in The Hague. And of course, yeah, and it played well. Ah, we're back, going back to Nuremberg. We're going to put people who kill their own people on trial. It played so well, they set up another court the next year in Rwanda uh, in, to deal with the uh, perpetrators of the genocide in Rwanda. And no one expected these courts to work. If you talk to the <coughs> diplomats at the time, they were PR stunts, they were fig leaves. They, justice, justice, no, we need to negotiate, they all said. And nothing really happened in the the killing stopped for a few months in uh, the Balkans after the court was set up, and then it started again because uh, no one really feared it. NATO said in 1997, arresting Karadzic is not worth the blood of one NATO soldier. Uh, and that was the attitude. And I think it's, uh, it's to Robin Cook very much, and uh, probably Madeleine Albright, uh, who decided that NATO should try to arrest a few concentration camp commandants and a few generals and so forth. And slowly at the end of, by, in 1999, it actually did. And of course, there was the other great event at the turn of the century, and it was the arrest of General Pinochet. He had come to London uh, to take tea with Mrs. Thatcher, as he regularly did. It was really whiskey. But uh, I'm told, but uh, he was uh, arrested on a warrant from a sp very courageous Spanish magistrate who had uh, charged him with crimes against humanity based on the torture convention, uh, one of the good conventions that had been signed by diplomats, signed by General Pinochet and Mrs. Thatcher. Uh, neither of them thought it would ever uh, cause their own arrest. And miraculously, uh, Scotland Yard, um, arrested him. He was uh, kept under house arrest, or mansion arrest at least, for 18 months. Everyone said, people like, it was amazing to, because uh, I was acting for Human Rights Watch in this case, and it was fascinating to see all the people who put pressure on Jack Straw to try to release him. There was, of course, uh, George Bush Sr. and Dr. Kissinger. There was the Pope, and the Pope in waiting, Mr. Ratzinger. Uh, and there was even Fidel Castro sent a note saying that the arrest of General Pinochet was a terrible insult to Latin American leaders. So uh, it was uh, an extraordinary event, uh, and it did 
bring up uh, very... And, and the, the final decision of the House of Lords was quite extraordinary. It was amazing. Outside in Parliament Square, there were all these torture victims and mothers whose children had disappeared. And the final uh, decision of the Law Lords was actually televised. And uh, on the radio, they could hear. And the first two, five judges, the first two voted uh, in favor of uh, upholding Pinochet's immunity. Uh, and one after the other, the next three, accepted our argument that uh, the Achilles heel of diplomatic immunity is the international crime, the crime against humanity which is constituted by widespread and systematic torture. And uh, it was very moving, that crowd really erupted. And uh, of course, one of the judges was found to have uh, had a connection with Amnesty International, and they had to hear the trial all over again. And uh, this time, and they had to find judges who had no interest whatsoever in human rights. And so they got uh, six contract uh, experts in commercial law and contract, and uh, who'd never would know a human right if they fell over it. But uh, what they did know was that they read. They weren't international lawyers. They didn't know that these good conventions were meant to be ignored and and uh, not to be enforced. And they read the torture convention, which said anyone accused of torture must either be tried or extradited for trial. And they said, well, this. This uh, convention me treaty means what it says. And so General Pinochet uh, was kept. And of course, there were lots of people who said, oh, it'll imperil the fragile democracy in Chile. Well, of course, uh, having him out of Chile uh, meant that uh, his, the amnesties that he'd granted himself could be overturned. And eventually, of course, Michelle Bachelet, who was herself the daughter of uh, one of his torture victims uh, became president. And they discovered all sorts of uh, corruption uh, in his regime. So that was important in making people think about the benefits and the virtues and the morality of international justice, of putting these people, no matter how late, uh, to some uh, difficulty and, and, if possible, on trial. Then we got Milosevic, and that seemed to herald the beginning. The indictment of Milosevic did weaken his position. He lost power, uh, and he was delivered to The Hague to stand trial. And at this point, September the 10th, 2001, one could say, uh, things were looking pretty good. But uh, there was a setback with... Uh, September the 11th, there was a particular setback by the Bush administration. You had in the first term, George Bush and his people adopted the most puerile, infantile attitude, uh, egged on by a man called Jesse Helms, who was a senator uh, of profoundly right-wing isolationist views. Uh, he passed what we call the Bomb the Hague Bill. It was the American Servicemen's Protection Act and it empowered the president to attack The Hague uh, if they arrested an American serviceman. Seriously, you believe it. This was 2002, ASPA. It's still on the, on the books, but no one's going to enforce it. And it wasn't till the second term. And of course, the one good thing, and, and a lot of pressure, American pressure, was put on states not to ratify the International Criminal Court Treaty. There'd been a conference in Rome that had agreed on a treaty for an international criminal court in 1998. No one thought it would get off the ground for ages because you needed 60 ratifying members. Amazingly, those 60 came by mid-2002. So we had an international criminal court from July 2002, but the Bush regime put pressure on all sorts of countries not to ratify and threaten to withdraw military support. So that was uh, a difficult period for international justice with this, this superpower so opposed to it on, on quite childish reasons. But 
things changed. And, and it had this benefit that the European left, hard left, which saw Milosevic as a kind of incarnation of a, of a left-wing socialist hero, um, was condemning international justice as some thought, sort of American plot, uh, you, which could hardly run as an argument at a time uh, that the Americans were considering invading the Hague. So um, that, but Bush in his second term changed. Uh, I think Colin Powell was important. Uh, Darfur, the concern about genocide in Darfur led uh, Colin Powell to Security Council, to ask the Security Council to use its Chapter 4 powers. And interestingly enough, it did. China abstained, but it, at least it didn't use the superpower veto. America, utterly hypocritical, uh, having brought and asked the Security Council to act, then itself abstained for fear of Jesse Helms and the, the right-wing Republicans. But there it was, and uh, eventually uh, Bashir was indicted. And of course, uh, in C America was quite supportive in the end of uh, the ad hoc courts. We had uh, Charles Taylor, who no one who thought that he was safe in Nigeria. Things changed. Maybe he ran out of money. But uh, the Nigerians then made him available to the Sierra Leone court. Uh, I wanted to try him in Sierra Leone, but there were problems with security, and he, his trial went on in The Hague. It was televised, of course, in Sierra Leone, but I thought the great thing about the Sierra Leone court was it was able to do justice uh, at the scene of the crime. And I think that is important if, if security can be guaranteed. We've had Karadzic discovered eventually, Mladic discovered eventually, and taken to The Hague. And I think there's been a general satisfaction about the operation of the ICTY as a kind of predecessor of the International Criminal Court. I haven't been very happy with some aspects of it, particularly the delays. Milosevic was indicted. Uh, his trial went on for three years uh, before he died, and it was still a couple of years away from finishing. Now, this happens a lot, and I think the problem is partly nervous judges, who Milosevic was the first um, head of state to be tried, and they stood on their heads, bent over backwards to be nice to him. They allowed him to strut and fret his hours, days, weeks, years on the stage. They didn't require him to have counsel. They allowed him to grandstand and make all sorts of irrelevant speeches. Um, they should have given him much less leeway. Particular problem was the prosecution. Prosecutors, there's a great get overzealous. They think that they're sort of appointed by the world to put in every crime that the defendant could ever be said to have committed. They think they're writing history. They've got to learn to leave history to the historians and to uh, prosecute only those charges which uh, are overwhelming or overwhelmingly important. Uh, Karadi, uh, Mladic, for example, faces 11 charges over a number of years. There's only one charge that uh, need that the world wants him prosecuted for, and that is the massacre at Srebrenica. Seven thousand men and boys taken out uh, to the woods and shot by groups of Serbs who were blessed by Orthodox Serb priests before they did this terrible thing on Mladic's orders. It was Mladic who can be seen blowing smoke in the face of the pathetic Dutch cap UN captain who uh, was, uh, was meant to be keeping Srebrenica safe. So, uh, but again, you've got 
prosecutors who think they've got to throw everything at the defendant, and that causes trials to be uh, as long as unconscionably long, like Milosevic. Well, we're learning these lessons, I hope. And uh, Karadzic, uh, of course, is on trial at the moment. Mladic will come up soon. But the great thing, and of course, throughout this modern period where the Nuremberg legacy is being delivered on um, in, a, in all sorts of ways, we have had this battle between China. Russia is more opportunistic. It tends to um, vote to protect its own clients to whom it sold arms and uh, well, getting oil, but uh, it can be quite helpful. And America, of course, the Obama administration, quite frankly, is, uh, is almost uh, an associate member of the court. It's been uh, very supportive. But the, there are still issues of legitimacy, and they were solved in, in some <coughs> respects this year with Security Council Resolutions 1970 and 1973. These are terribly important resolutions because, first of all, they were unanimous. Secondly, Resolution 1970 referred the situation in Libya to the International Criminal Court Prosecutor. Unanimous decision. Now, it may well be that it is because Gaddafi was so crazed or so unpopular uh, amongst uh, in, in the world leaders who had to suffer him that uh, that went through. But it was a, an imprimatur on uh, the role of international justice in d deciding, uh, in, in having jurisdiction, having power, that's what jurisdiction means over people who kill their own people. It came after those blood-curdling broadcasts that uh, Gaddafi and his son made um, about uh, slitting the throats of the rats in Benghazi. And then uh, Resolution 1973, which empowered NATO to use, I quote, all necessary means to protect the civilians. Uh, I think, in effect, NATO decided that it was necessary to overthrow the Gaddafi regime uh, to protect civilians, and certainly uh, its actions went far beyond those of uh, a no-fly zone. But uh, this raises the issue of liberal, what is called liberal interventionism, uh, a very uh, controversial topic especially in light of those who criticize it, always refer to the invasion of Iraq. But this seems to me to be totally wrong, because George Bush was no liberal. He didn't invade Iraq because Saddam had killed at least 100,000 of his own people over the years. We invaded Iraq because we believed that he had weapons of mass destruction. That was, of course, false. Quite why George Bush decided to invade Iraq. He told a, a group of senators that it was because Saddam had tried to tried to kill my dad. Uh, well, that's probably. Uh, as good a reason as any that you'd get from George Bush. But uh, there it is. Uh, there is now a United Nations doctrine that has emerged from a uh, committee. It's been, it was adopted by Kofi Annan. It is called the Responsibility to Protect. And it's a very clever amalgam of Westphalian theory, which of course is all based on the absolute right of the state, and modern desire to stop 
the mass murder of people, civilians at the mercy of powerful um, leaders. It uh, virtually it, it is based on the uh, Westphalian uh, view that states are independent, but and and one state can't intervene in another state's business, but where a state fails in its responsibility to protect its own citizens, where they are um, suffering from crimes against humanity brought about by the government, then uh, the United Nations, through the Unanimous Security Council, is entitled to intervene to stop the killing. It's, uh, uh, as it were, uh, the state fails in its uh, duty to look after its own people. Uh, the United Nations is entitled to intervene. That was the basis of the resolutions 1970 and 1973. And, of course, you could well ask, well, why isn't it uh, then the basis for intervention in <coughs> Syria? today? Uh, and that's a good question. And you might like to ask it or indeed ask other questions because I see uh, we've gone for long enough uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about uh, this uh, quite remarkable development, which I do want to stress has come about in the last few years. It, it is really only in the last 10 years that uh, this doctrine, the idea of justice, has replaced um, expediency as uh, a very important factor in international affairs. Wonderful. Thank you very much. of international criminal law, and we have about 20, 25 minutes for questions, so if you can try and keep them short, and um, we'll take a few at a time, so I'm going to go here, here, and here first. Um, well, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, you discussed, uh, Tony, you discussed the legacy of Nuremberg extensively. Um, it's arguable that one of the main legacies of Nuremberg is, in fact, the, uh, the main crime they were tried for, which was crimes against peace. And the crime of aggression was only recently agreed on at the Kampala Review Conference of the ICC last year. Mm. Coming from a human rights perspective, as I think you are in your chambers on human rights, uh, the court has often been seen as a human rights instrument. Do you think if the crime of aggression is ultimately fully institutionalized into the ICC, it will fit comfortably, uncomfortably? Will it be a positive or a negative development for the court extending its role away from human rights and into wars of aggression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd just be very interested to hear your view on the killing of Osama bin Laden. Yeah. Uh, also in the news today was the fact that Tony Blair and George Bush are on trial in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. You, what are your thoughts on that and how... <laughs> no, I don't think it's laughable. Mm. I think it's important and how that international criminal law can extend to what may be seen as hegemonic powers and not just the relatively weak and developed yeah, I know. I, I think it's very interesting, uh, the fact that uh, George Bush's retirement travel is considerably constrained by the people who want to bring him to justice uh, for aggression, actually, because that's the crime that uh, arguably he committed in invading Iraq. The, you know, I go back to the protesters on the streets in Damascus with their banners. Uh, El Assad to The Hague. It is uh, a lovely idea, if you like. Chris Hitchens was one of the first to develop it. I don't know whether you've seen the film about Kissinger, putting Kissinger on trial for uh, some of his decisions, his uh, support for Pinochet and so forth. He too has uh, a, a, a limited travel schedule. But uh, it is part of the Malaysian proceedings, the Proceedings in Belgium, in particular, uh, are getting over the idea, however unreal it may be at the moment, that 
international criminal law will one day feel the collars of the most powerful. Now, um, Mengistu. Mengistu is someone I feel very strongly about because he was the mass murdering Marxist in Ethiopia and he rushed to the protection of Robert Mugabe and he tried, he needed a heart operation ago, so he went down to Cape Town and then a paper found that he was there and he had to rush back <laughs> without his heart operation uh, to uh, Mugabe's protection. The minute Mugabe falls, Mengistu becomes available uh, for international justice. It is that kind of uh, progress, I think. I mean, ten years ago, we hadn't indicted anyone, uh, any head of state. The Pinochet thing came as an enormous shock. Today we are. Uh, we are still... Uh, Assad is slipping, and I think there may be, before the year is out, uh, a resolution 1970 that will allow the International Criminal Court at least to start compiling a dossier on him, his family, possibly even his wife, his uh, fragrant British wife who, uh, by giving him aid and comfort, may well uh, aid and abet his crimes. There are things that, I think, gets the idea going, even though at this moment, uh, there is no prospect of Bush, Blair, uh, anyone, uh, or a Western leader being prosecuted for crimes against humanity. But mine, it, it teaches them to mind how they go. Their targeting decisions have been affected very much by uh, international criminal law, and uh, that can only be a good thing. Uh, as to aggression, uh, I think it... I hope that it will come into the, um, a, as a crime, but at the moment it's defined by reference to a Security Council decision, or at least by it, it will be the Security Council that will decide whether uh, a leader can be put on trial for aggression. I'm in favour of it as a crime um, because it seems to me that waging aggressive war is, for example, Saddam uh, would have committed that crime by invading Kuwait. That's, a, 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 I think, a, a good example of where the crime is necessary. And uh, his uh, attacks on the Kurds by chemical gas may also come within that area. So I'm uh, supportive of the crime of aggression entering the lexicon. It's there in Nuremberg. It's, it's uh, something that the Kampala conference, as you rightly say, uh, approved, but it's not <coughs> clear when it's going to actually <laughs> be operational. So, uh, but the problem with the American theory of uh, preemptive uh, strikes and um, preventative self-defense is that it just doesn't match with Article 51 of the Charter or with the general international law relating to self-defense, which doesn't give a state uh, merely because it fears or speculates that it may be in some way under attack uh, the right to um, invade and overthrow another state. It's interesting to consider that if that view had prevailed, in 2001, it would have permitted America to attack Afghanistan, to occupy all the cave area where bin Laden was. I mean, I think that's entirely uh, reasonable in terms of self-defense after 9-11, but it would not have justified overthrow of the Taliban government. And so uh, Afghanistan would not on that basis have been the problem that it is. As for Osama, well, uh, it was a capture operation or a kill operation. There's a book that suggests it was a capture operation, but that's been derided widely, and uh, the 
belief is that it was really a kill operation. And I think that's wrong. And uh, that is, it amounts to murder, or certainly execution. And it raises a very real question about the use of drones, uh, in a sense. Uh, the Obama administration is using drones far more regularly than the Bush administration did. And this is uh, the neat euphemism, collateral damage uh, really doesn't express the horror of killing children and killing innocents by drone attacks on villages. And it is a kind of it's Churchill's list, isn't it? It's drawing up a list of people who are, who think are guilty, and uh, then pressing a button that uh, kills them and other people, or sometimes just kills other people. It's not satisfactory. I tend to, however, I think the mission to capture Obama and kill him only if necessary in self-defense uh, was justified, I think, it, because he was an international criminal. He should have been tried for crimes against humanity, um, and that going in in circumstance and, and killing him first uh, was wrong. Many people say, oh, it would have saved us all the, the horror of a trial. Well, <coughs> it certainly gave him what he wanted, didn't it? It gave him the fast track to paradise. Uh, Osama wanted nothing more than to be killed mid-jihad. The last thing he would have wanted was to end his life on a prison farm in upstate New York. Uh, I can't imagine anything that would have uh, tortured him more. Um, so uh, I think that from all, and of course the great thing about trial is that they do, uh, if properly conducted, uh, produce a lot of intelligence, they produce a lot of history, they produce a deal of truth. And I, it's very important because what the press haven't picked up today, they might twig to it later in the week, is that, far more important than say, is that Al Sanusi has been caught. Now, Al Sanusi ran Libyan intelligence. He's brother-in-law of uh, the Colonel Gaddafi and was deeply involved in blowing up uh, the French passenger jet over Chad, the UTA jet in 1989. He's been convicted in absentia in France, not that I agree with trials in absentia unless they have execution in absentia as well. <laughs> but uh, I, he does know where all the bodies are buried. He's responsible. He knows about Lockerbie. He knows about the IRA funding. Uh, he knows uh, every uh, gift that the Gaddafi regime has made to terrorist organizations and so on. And he's in control of people who could hang him from the next lamppost. And I think this is <laughs> the great danger of trial <coughs> of, of course, people who are newly uh, newly enfranchised want to kill those who <coughs> oppressed them. It's not particularly a, a point against the Libyan people or any people who have this <coughs> righteous anger that explodes. Look at the way they strung up Mussolini and his mistress. But, you know, it is, and, and look at the way Jack Ruby was allowed. Remember that you, you don't, you weren't born, most of you. But uh, my generation will remember the Dallas cops uh, bringing Lee Harvey Oswald forward and almost standing aside by a fellow called Jack Ruby shot him. Uh, that's that's uh, understandable, but it's got to be stopped. It's not right. And Al Sanusi is, you know, he's the crown jewels, and and getting him alive to the Hague and available for debriefing is really important. So uh, that my answer is that Osama, alive rather than dead, uh, it would be a much better way for the world to go. Yeah, I wonder what your thoughts are about the uh, <coughs> global efforts to crack down on impunity against um, those who 
kill uh, journalists, uh, human rights uh, defenders, not losing mm. freedom of expression. Day after tomorrow has been named uh, International Day Against Impunity by IFEX, the Freedom of Expression Exchange. And the UN in September had its first interagency meeting to deal with this. Yeah. And, and this is a classic of your thing about sovereign states because the audit system that the UN has allows states to refuse even to give information on requests, and UNESCO is the weakest of the UN right. agencies, but of course you have the Human Rights Council, the Human Rights Committee has just come up with a landmark new interpretation of international law on freedom of expression, extremely hard-hitting, yeah. General Comment 34, which, which implies there is a positive obligation on states to protect those who are threatened when they use freedom of expression, as, as well as to uh, not to, not to allow impunity to, to mm. prosecute. I wonder what you make of all that. Um, you mentioned the length of uh, especially the ICTY trials where there's many charges and kind of a menu of charges that the prosecutors throw. Mm. Um, I think when you look at the first trial of the International <coughs> Criminal Court where Thomas Lubanga, the DRC yeah. warlord, was only charged for one, literally there was only one charge that proved mm. child soldiers, um, and in fact the trial has lasted very long. <laughs> there are obviously other reasons for that. Um, but actually, if you look at subsequent trials, I think the prosecutor has learned to perhaps try him, for perhaps try suspects with more charges, um, just in case you lose one, um, you'll, you'll have the other ones to fall back on. Yeah. So do you think it's, I, I tend, what I tend to think is that maybe it's just in the nature of international criminal trials that they last a very long time, rather than anything to do with kind of, you know, necessarily the prosecutorial strategy. The uh, your work in Syria no. Syria no? You work in Syria. Sierra Leone, oh yes. Um first I want to comment the the Air Force and uh, the landmark um uh, judgment uh, that took place at the Ivory Court that's where I live. Um no doubt it has contributed also more into redefining gender crimes, uh, where um there were new jurisprudence on issues of uh, forced marriage and sexual slavery. Mm. But looking at that, then looking at the fact that just 13 people were actually indicted in Syria, given the previous human rights violation that took place in that place, I was just wondering what is the implication of uh, trying 13 people in a place where uh, people wake up in the morning and still see people who committed those atrocities against them walking on the street. What's the implication of that to global justice? And secondly, looking at uh, Liberia, uh, unlike in Syria, you know, where there was a special court dealing with this issue, in Liberia, nothing seems to have been done, in particular about trying the offenders beyond uh, Chastelo being taken to Syria. Mm. And I wonder, especially given what has happened in Africa in the last uh, few years, what is the implication of that to end the impunity? Yeah. That's a, a really important question because you can't, unless you've been there, understand uh, the enormity of what happened in places like Sierra Leone. Uh, you, we had a football team uh, that we sponsored at the court who were people who had had their limbs hacked because one of the factions after the UN-sponsored election went round saying, which was opposed to the election, went round to people and said, what hand did you use to mark the card? Right, put it out, bang, off. <coughs> and uh, our football team had lost hands, they lost legs, they were amazing. But it is hard to, uh, we were tasked to prosecute those who were primarily responsible for this viciousness, a viciousness, you know, that uh, they had the juju belief that killing, eating your enemy's heart gives you your enemy's strength. And uh, we had to watch cases where people, prisoners had been killed and, and their hearts eaten. Uh, it was that kind of war. But, and, and after that horror, where um, you 
you do understand how difficult it is for people to have a drink or walk across and see on the same street the person who chopped their hand off. This was even worse, I think, in South Africa, where the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, much written about and much overrated and much misinterpreted, uh, in my view, had um, gay, couldn't prosecute anyone, but gave actual pardons to people who came and talked. And uh, I, I think Joe Slover was it, or certainly some of the, the apartheid heroes who had their <coughs> families, children, and, and uh, relatives killed by Craig Williamson, who was the informer who sent uh, the letter bombs that blew up Jill, uh, a number of, uh, uh, of significant anti-apartheid figures. And they speak of the difficulty of seeing him at a bar sort of knocking back beers and telling all and sundry of his exploits in BOSS, the South African Security Service. It's very hard. Um, and all I can, all we can say, I think, to survivors is firstly, there is a role for truth commissions in enabling people to tell the story of what happened to them, uh, in getting the forcing the lesser players who may have shot the guns or whatever or, or wielded the uh, machete to uh, sit round the table with their victims and talk. Uh, that, that may offer some way forward, forgiveness after <coughs> all at the end of the day. And the sight of those who led them astray, but led them to those barbarities, being locked up for the rest of their lives may give some satisfaction. That is perhaps the best we can do. Prosecuting everyone uh, would be too expensive for a start. And that's the simple real politic uh, of why international justice at this juncture is limited to those primarily responsible and doesn't Yet I would have very much liked the ICTY to prosecute the priests, the um, Serb Orthodox priests who blessed the killing squads at Srebrenica, because I think that uh, we have, as you say, in Sierra Leone, we were the first court to uh, declare that recruiting child soldiers is against international law, that forced marriages uh, are against international law. Uh, and sexual slavery. And, and yes, that was done in relation to the, uh, those primarily responsible. But it is difficult uh, for those who were made sexual slaves by middle-ranking uh, people in armies to suffer them again. The prosecution, yes, um, prosecutors, I think, sometimes want to do a Nuremberg, they want to do the whole history. Uh, sometimes they take the view tactically that they want to throw a lot of charges in in the hope that one will stick. That's a common prosecutorial tactic. Uh, I think you're right in this respect that international trials are necessarily going to take longer than national trials because you've got translation problems for a start. I mean, everything in even the simplest motion in the ICTY has to be translated into French. Even if no one speaks it, it's got to be translated into French but, um, and English. And uh, you've got inevitably a lot of witnesses to protect. And uh, it takes many of them have, uh, will not have been in a court before, particularly if you've got something going on in The Hague and you need to get your witnesses or your evidence from the Balkans or from Africa. Yes, that, that is, I don't pretend that uh, trials are going to be as fast, but they've got to be faster. And I think the Milosevic trial, where now I think everyone accepts that putting, accusing him in effect of three different wars was uh, a mistake and they should have concentrated on the, the one charge that uh, 
they had the most evidence on, there was overwhelming evidence in relation to Kosovo, um, that would have convicted him, I think, probably within a year. It was simple, it was all on television, and uh, that could have, uh, at least, uh, proceedings could have ended before he died. So I do think we can't expect international justice to uh, be as fast as national justice, but there is room for improvement. Journalists, yes, and human rights monitors who go out and write reports and perform a journalistic function for Amnesty and Human Rights Watch. I have a big argument that goes on, been going on for a few years with the Red Cross on this because the Red Cross see themselves as the guardians of the Geneva Convention. And there is, uh, there's no reference to journalists in the first set of Geneva Conventions, but in the second uh, set of Geneva Conventions there are some references to journalists uh, being protected as civilians in war. So journalists have no special protection in international law. They are treated as civilians. The problem with this, as I try to tell the Red Cross, is they're not killed as civilians. They're killed because they're journalists. They're killed before because they're human rights monitors, because they might go and testify uh, at an international court. That's why they're killed. And uh, I think uh, I've been arguing that uh, journalists and human rights monitors in war zones uh, need special protection by having making it an international crime, an international war crime, to target journalists. Uh, I think this is a development that uh, we'll have to now wait <coughs> for the next review conference, but a number of states are interested in, in having it. Unless you have it as a specific crime, you will just have this idea that journalists can be, um, can be treated as civilians, and they're not uh, journalists, so long as they don't take up sides in, by taking up guns, uh, are entitled to maintain their neutrality. We've had, I acted for the Washington Post journalist uh, Randall in those proceedings in the ICTR, which said that war correspondents did have uh, a privilege from testifying, the problem in, in trying to drag journalists in front of international courts where the war is still going on is that if they testify for the prosecution they'll be seen uh, as uh, party pre the prosecution and so they won't be able to exercise uh, their function and they may well be subject to attack by uh, the other side. So uh, there is an important uh, principle I think at stake uh, and there is a strong argument for making it a specific war crime to kill a journalist. Well, I know there are a number of people with questions, but...